Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's online service. So glad to be back. We had a wonderful time of vacation. It was great to get away. I know, uh, sorry we weren't able to do a YouTube video last week for, for service, but uh, we are doing one this morning. If you missed last week, we did a live stream from the auditorium. You can check that out on Facebook. If you look for our Facebook page, you'll be able to find that. Uh, we're just not able to do both at the same time. And I realize we got YouTube subscribers, we've got Facebook followers. And uh, so that's another way that you can tune in. If you want to uh, watch the service live, we do have live praise and worship in here. Services are always at 11 o'clock and are uh, maybe not as on time as our online streaming. We, this starts promptly at 11. We probably start at maybe five or six after here in building uh, to accommodate people who are coming in late. But it's just great to be able to worship together, to fellowship with one another. Look forward to being able to see you in one of our services here real soon. Well, we're going to open up with a word of prayer here in just a moment. But I want to remind everybody, Indian Youth Camp is now less than two weeks away. It's actually a week from this Monday. If you have not gotten registered for camp, the early registration is closed. However, there may still be an opportunity to go to camp, but you need to come see us. Let us know that you're interested, and uh, we'll, we'll try to get uh, find you a spot in the camp. And it's, it's a great opportunity. It's going to be a lot of fun. Cost is $80 per student. It's for ages 9 to 15. The camp location is at Hungry Horse, Montana, at the Glacier Bible Camp. And it's easy to find if you're if you're you know, custom to drive into Kalispell, for example, when you're passing through Hungry Horse, just before you get to that new bridge on the right hand side of the road, you'll see a green sign that says Glacier Bible Camp. And it's not even a quarter of a mile down that road, down down by the river. You'll see it's a great facility, a wonderful campus. We're going to have a great year of camp. We've got over 50 kids signed up for camp right now from Browning. So uh, we're going to have a, we're going to have an awesome time looking forward to seeing what God's going to do at camp this year. Well, if you've got a Bible with you, I want you to find the book of Acts. We're going to get into the scriptures here in just a moment. But let's welcome the Holy Spirit. Let's, let's ask Him to speak to our hearts this morning. Can we do that? Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you for your presence in our homes, cars, wherever we happen to be watching this live or listening to it after the fact. Lord, we just ask that your presence would fill the place where we happen to be right now. Speak to our hearts. Give us understanding of your word and of your ways. Lord, help us to see the things that you want us to know and respond to. Show us what's important to your heart today. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. All right. Well, we are in the book of Acts as we have been for the last 15 weeks. This is our 16th message in the book of Acts. We're going to call this one Outbound. Outbound. We're going to be in Acts chapter 13 this week. We're going to be starting a new segment of the book of Acts this morning. So if you got a Bible, I want you to find Acts 13. We'll read a couple earlier verses, but we're primarily going to go through the first half of Acts 13. In Acts chapter 13, we begin, like I said, a new segment of the book of Acts. We've been looking at the book primarily through the Acts 1-8 pattern. If we were to look back at Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says, But you will receive power. Say power. It says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That means Holy Spirit wants to come upon you and be involved in your life. And Jesus said, you will be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. So we look at those three geographic designations, Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, furthest reaches of the earth. And those form three parts to the book of Acts. It's a book that starts in Jerusalem and expands outward. It's very opposite of the book of Luke, which starts outward and expands inward to Jerusalem. The three divisions of the book of Acts, again, follow the, the pattern in verse 8. They find the witness of Jerusalem in the earliest chapters. Then from chapter 8 onwards, we find the witness in Judea and Samaria. Then the witness to the remotest part of the earth starts in Acts chapter 13, which is where we're going to pick things up today. Well, we could also look at the book of Acts as being divided up into two separate segments. We could divide it in half, not necessarily in terms of number of chapters, there's 28 chapters, but you can almost divide it in half, almost down the middle, if we cut it in, in two between chapters 13 and chapter 12. The first half of the book tends, now again, this is not a universally correct 
statement, okay, but it tends to follow the ministry of Peter uh, from chapters 1 to 12. That's not always the case. Chapters 6, 7, 8, and 9, uh, he's not the main focus of the attention there, uh, but it tends to focus on Peter and his ministry in the first 12 chapters. The second half, from chapter 12 onwards, it follows the ministry of Paul, who we've been introduced to as Saul of Tarsus. We're going to find out his uh, his Roman name here in chapter 13. But starting in chapter 13, the, the focus of the book tends to follow Paul's ministry. So we're starting that second half of the book of Acts today. But something I haven't pointed out up until now, I'm going to take a few moments to, to talk about. And the reason I'm splitting Acts chapter 13 into two segments is because there's just too much in the chapter to get into one week and do it any kind of remote justice. Uh, Paul's first sermon is going to be coming up in chapter 13, and we want to spend a little bit of time on that. So uh, we're going to we're just going to look at the first 12 verses this morning. So we're not going to get uh, too far into the chapter that allows us to look at some other things here. One of which is the fact that there's at least now there's more than this, but there's eight parallels that are very easily seen between Peter and Paul's ministry in the book of Acts. If we overlay the two, we look at them, you'll find stuff that happens in the first 12 verses or first 12 chapters. You're going to find a parallel through Paul's ministry in uh, the latter half of the book. So let's look at those, those parallels there. First of all, they both see a lame man healed. Peter in Acts chapter 3, Paul in Acts chapter 14. Both of them confront a sorcerer. Uh, Peter does at uh, Samaria. He confronts Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8, and then Paul's going to confront one on Cyprus, and we're going to look at that this morning. Both of them are in prison. Paul on numerous occasions, but notably in Acts chapter 16, Paul's in prison. Peter is in prison in Acts chapter 12. He's also in prison in Acts chapter 4. Uh, both of them are supernaturally delivered from prison. And so we find that happens for, we looked at that last time, Peter in Acts chapter 12, Paul in Acts chapter 16. Both of them are involved in the conversion of high-ranking Gentile officials. Cornelius is led to the Lord through Peter's ministry in Acts chapter 10. We're going to see Sergius Paulus, the Roman proconsul or governor of Cyprus, is going to come to know Jesus through Paul's ministry. Both of them are involved in believers, people who, who have come to know and follow Jesus, who receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit after a delay. Both uh, Peter and Paul confront situations where there's believers who have not yet been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and through their ministry, uh, those people then become filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit. You find that with Peter in Acts chapter 8 in Samaria, Paul at uh, Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. Both of them are supernaturally directed in ministry by a dream or a vision. And that we saw in Acts chapter 10 for, with Peter. He saw that vision on the rooftop. Paul receives a night vision. It's, uh, it's either at the end of chapter 15 or the beginning of chapter 16 uh, when, when that happens. And he's told to go over into Macedonia and minister there. So uh, both of them also see a dead person raised back to life. Dorcas is raised to life through Peter's ministry in Acts chapter 9. And a guy, I think his name, I think it's Uticus, is uh, raised to life after he falls out of a window. He's sitting in, you know, because there's wide, thick, you know, stone walls. You can kind of sit in a windowsill. It's a comfortable place in the evening. You know, the wind, the breeze is moving through there. It might be kind of hot and stuffy in the room. And so he's sitting there and he's leaning back and he's listening to the message. And Paul's just really preaching a long message. And this guy falls out of the window and uh, and there was no life in him. They went and prayed and, and he's raised back to life. You find that in Acts 12. 20, I think. It's either 19 or 20, somewhere in there. So we'll look at that as we uh, encounter those later on. I just want you to see those parallels, though. There's some structural parallels between uh, the two halves of the book of Acts. Now, before we get into Acts 13, what I want to do is look at the last couple of verses of Acts chapter 11 and the last verse of Acts chapter 12. And if we string those all together, it's going to really nicely set up the context for the passage we're going to get into today. So if we look back at Acts chapter 11, verse 27, it says, Now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would, be, there would certainly be a great famine over all the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius, the Roman emperor. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders 
down in Jerusalem. So they traveled down into Jerusalem, actually up to Jerusalem. You always go up to Jerusalem, you go down from Jerusalem. All right, so they, they travel from uh, 300 miles from up in Antioch. They bring this gift to the church in Jerusalem. They're there for an undetermined period of time. They're probably present for the goings-on uh, that surrounded uh, the execution of Jacob, one of the 12, and uh, uh, Peter being in prison, supernaturally released. They were probably present for those things. Okay, then at the end of Acts chapter 12, verse 25, it says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. Okay, that brings us to the very beginning of Acts chapter 13. Now, before we get into it real quickly, we'll just outline the chapter into three parts, and we'll do it, we'll organize it geographically. The first three verses take place in Antioch, and that's where we find a commission is made in chapter uh, 13 verses 4 to 12, we see the scenery is going to change to the island of Cyprus and there's a confrontation. We're going to look at that this morning. Next week, we'll look at what takes place at Pisidian Antioch. There's numerous cities in the Greek world at that time named Antioch. And so to differentiate them, sometimes the Antioch in Syria is called Syrian Antioch. Pisidian Antioch is in uh, southern Galatia. It's in uh, what's today central part of the country of Turkey. And we'll see Paul's very first sermon is preached there. So we're going to look at a proclamation in verses 13 to 52. And I wanted to allocate appropriate time to look at that passage. So we'll look at that one next week. So we're just going to go through the first 12 verses this morning. We'll start at Antioch with the commission that takes place there. Now, pay attention to what happens in these first three verses. It sounds very introductory and unimportant, but ultimately I think it lays the groundwork, the foundation, everything that happens in chapters 13 and 14, can be traced back to what took place here in just these first three verses. It says in verse 1, Now there were at Antioch, in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen or Menachem, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. It says there was at Antioch in the church, there was prophets and teachers. Now, you probably heard uh, teachings or messages referring to the fivefold ministry gifts. Uh, you're going to find those in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 11, where it says that the Lord Jesus apportions giftings that are on, the, the, the giftings are upon people's lives, but they're gifts to the church as a whole. And their ministry gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, that concept of fivefold ministry probably has not been fully developed at the time in which this is taking place. However, it's, it is recognized that there are certain personages that have a prophetic gifting upon their life, and there's people in the church that have a teaching gift upon their life. And those two working together is a very powerful combination. And so we understand by this that the church in Antioch had been generously equipped by the Lord Jesus to be a powerful church. People with prophetic and teaching gifts upon their lives were active in the church. They weren't just in the church, you know, sitting back. They were active in the church, and the giftings of their, on their lives were flowing and benefiting everyone that was a part of that church in Antioch. Now, when it says prophets and teachers, I'd like to just pause a moment and, and point out the symmetry between those ministry gifts, prophets and teachers. There's a symmetry between them. Prophets tell us what God is saying. What is God saying like right now? You know, many times we look at a prophet and we think of somebody that's going to tell me the future. We, we, almost, look at, we almost look at prophetic giftings upon people's lives as though it's almost like a fortune-telling kind of a thing. Uh, they're, they're almost like a Christian version of a psychic. And that's really unfortunate because that's not what a prophet really is. Biblically speaking, a prophet tells what God, it commu a prophet communicates to us what is God saying right now. Okay, that's, that's what the role of the prophet is. The teacher tells us what God has already said in his word. I tend to operate more in that. I've operated in both giftings, but I tend to operate more in the teaching area, as you probably have picked up on. Okay, so the teacher tells us this is what God has said. The prophet tells us this is what God is saying. And many times the prophet's going to use what God has already said in his forth telling of what God is saying now. So just understand what those two giftings are and how important they are to the church. 
Now, in verse 1, there's five people that are mentioned. Yeah, Barnabas and Saul and Simeon and Lucius and Menachem. Uh, regarding these characters, let's look at what, the, what, what we think we know about them for just a moment. There's some interesting little tidbits that you can unearth if you dig into this a little bit. You should take these with a grain of salt because this is based on, you know, church tradition. Some of this may or may or just be simply conjecture on our part. And so we're going to speculate just a little bit here, but I'm going to tell you what we think we know about these characters. Saul and Barnabas, we're not going to worry about them now because we've already seen quite a bit about them and we're going to learn more in the chapters to come. But what about this guy, Simeon called Niger? The, his, his suffix Niger uh, probably is, is uh, it refers to his dark skin color. He's thought to be the man from Cyrene in North Africa, which is today Libya, who was pressed into service to bear Jesus' cross. Remember when Jesus was crucified, the Romans pressed a bystander into service to help him carry the cross beam to the place of execution. Uh, you find that in Luke 23, Matthew 27, Mark 15. All three synoptic gospels mention this. They mention his name. It is believed that this is that character. It's also believed that his sons, Rufus and Alexander, uh, become very involved in the church as well and may be referenced in Paul's book to the Romans in chapter 16, verse 13 of the book of Romans. So that's what we think we know about uh, Simon called Niger. Now, Lucius of Cyrene... Some people think that that's actually a reference to Luke, the writer of the book of Luke and the writer of the, the book of Acts. I don't hold that view. There's, there's lots of reasons why I think that that's probably not true. Uh, we're going to run into uh, some, some first-person uh, pronouns that indicate that Luke was a traveling companion of Paul. We'll bump into some of those a little bit later. Instead, what we really think is that Lucius of Cyrene might have been one of the original planters of the church in Antioch. Remember, the church in Antioch, according to Acts 11 verse 20, was founded by some Hellenistic Jews who were from North Africa, from Cyrene. And so Simeon and Lucius might have been some of those founding fathers of the church in Antioch. Menachem, it's, it's spelled out Menaeum in, the, in your uh, English Bibles, but that's the Greek form of a common Hebrew name, Menachem. He's uh, believed to be the foster brother of Herod Antipas. This is an interesting guy. It's not entirely evident from the English translations, but if you get into the Greek here, the, the term that Luke uses for him indicates that he was probably a foster brother adopted into the household of Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas was one of the sons of Herod the Great. He is the Herod responsible. Herod Antipas is the Herod responsible for the execution, the beheading of John the Baptizer and the abuse of Jesus before the crucifixion. So that's who that, that, that character is, and Menachem may have grown up in that household. If that is true, then he may be one of Luke's key sources of the inside information. There's lots of times where Luke shares insider information, and, and, and skeptics have wondered, how does he know this? Where does he get that from? Well, first of all, the scripture's in, inspired. Holy Spirit could easily communicate that knowledge to us. But beyond that, there are some key people that are kind of in the background of our Bibles, but if we were to go back in that time, they were actually prominent personages in sensitive positions who may have been in on the know, as it were. So Menachem may have been one of the, the sources that shares uh, information that Luke imparts in both his gospel and in the book of Acts. Now, regarding these five people, Barnabas, Simeon, and Lucius, are separated from Menachem and Saul by a different Greek connective. It's not apparent in your English Bibles, but if you look at the original language, there's a different connective that separates the three from the two, and it's because of that that some believe that Barnabas, Simeon, and Lucius were the ones that were operating in the prophetic giftings. Menachem and Saul were probably the ones with the teaching gifting upon their lives. And so uh, that's just a, it's a conjecture, but I think it does make sense given the grammar that's used here. So that's what's going on there in verse one. Let's move on to verse two here. While they were ministering to the Lord, I want you to pay attention to that. Some of your Bibles might say while they were worshiping the Lord, but I like the way the New American Standard says it. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. 
while they were ministering to the Lord. You know, there's lots of reasons why we go to church. There's lots of reasons that people will go to a church service on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night or something. Uh, many times it is there is a, a self-fulfilling reason. There's a reason I, I'm missing something, I'm lacking something, I'm going to get something. And that's not entirely a wrong perspective, okay? I, I understand that. There's, there's people that go to church because they have a guilty conscience. There's people that go to church because they're trying to get right with God somehow. There's people that go to church because they're curious. There's people that go to church because they want to learn more about God. But there's people that have really come to know the Lord Jesus in a deep, personal, and intimate way. And they want to gather together with other believers and a church service provides a useful context for that. And their whole purpose is they want to go and minister to the Lord. Think about it. At any given moment, there are people across this planet in the last five seconds that curse Jesus, that accused him of things he never did. They're, they're falsely accusing him. They're cursing him. They're blaspheming him. Blaspheming him. All of that's gone on just in the last few seconds worldwide. But there's also people that have gathered in the last five seconds that have praised him, that have worshipped him, that have, that have expressed love to him. There's, there's, a, there's something about gathering together and ministering to the Lord that's important for us to be able to do. And as we grow and mature in our faith, this is something that I think that we need to be intentional about doing. While they're ministering to the Lord, look at what happens in that environment. A foundation... I believe a foundation of devotion and complete and total reliance upon Jesus is being laid here from the get-go. What's happening here in this context, in this church service, is going to be the foundation for what they're going to have to be able to do to fulfill the call that God has on their life as we get further into the chapter. Everything that happens in chapters 13 and 14 can rest upon this season what they're learning and what they're doing here in the season of worship. Everything we see happen in this and the following chapters, as I said, can be traced back to this season where people of God are ministering to the Lord Jesus. They're praying, they're fasting. Let's look at what happens in that environment. In that environment, the Holy Spirit speaks to the church. Remember, in the church, there's prophets. Prophets tell us this is what God is saying. And so there's probably a prophetic word that's given, and the Holy Spirit is saying, set apart unto me. You have something. It's a gift to your church. You, there's a couple people in your church. They are a gift to you, and I want you to release them to me because I have something for them to do. In this environment, Holy Spirit instructs the church to release Barnabas and Saul. He says, I've got work to which I have called them. Release them to me. The key strength, you know, I talk a lot about the Antioch church, about how it was this powerhouse, this multicultural, multi-ethnic powerhouse that really influenced the world in that time. In its time, it was the most influential church in that season of church history. But the strength of that church wasn't in what they had and kept to themselves. Man, we have all the five-fold ministry gifts kicking and working in this church. It is a smooth operating machine. It's not what they had and kept. It was what they were willing to give and release. Think about for just a second, what is the Holy Spirit asking them to do? He's asking them to give up one-third of the prophetic giftings in their, in their church. The people that have really ministered prophetically give up one-third of that. They're losing a third of their prophets and they're losing half of their teachers. That's, that's a big thing to give up, right? That's, that's not a simple thing to give up. But sometimes we read these things and we think, oh yeah, set apart for them. No, they're going to say goodbye to these guys and they're not going to see them for years. The strength of that church, though, wasn't in what they had and kept. It was in what they were willing to to give and release. And I believe that's true for us as well. It can be true for us as individuals. What are you willing, what has God given you that you're willing to release back to Him? Whether it's your finances, whether it's the gifting on your life, what are you willing to release back to Him? Verse 3, Then when they had fasted and prayed, and they laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Now, we send somebody away. You can get on the phone, you text them, Facebook, FaceTime, WhatsApp. You can use all these different things. They weren't going to see these guys. They don't know if they're ever going to see these guys ever again. 
So understand the cost involved here. When they had fasted and prayed, they sent him away. Uh, pay attention to prayer in the book of Acts. It shows up in nearly every chapter, nearly every important, significant thing that's going on in the book of Acts. Prayer is happening in the background of it. And here it mentions prayer and fasting. Fasting as an intentional act by the church happens on three occasions in the book of Acts. They're all connected with the Acts 13 and 14, all connected with sending people into ministry. So let's talk just a moment about prayer and fasting, because I find them to be the two bookends of this great missionary endeavor that's taking place here in Acts chapters 13 and 14, sometimes called the first missionary journey. It's in this season of prayer and fasting that the Holy Spirit's call gets heard. You know, sometimes you have a sense there's, there's more, God wants to do something more with my life. I've told people before, I'll say it again, you, you take, take three days, shut out all the noise, get alone with God, pray and fast, see if you don't hear from him. I'm telling you, just expect to hear from him. In that kind of environment, I don't see how you, you don't hear from God in that. It's in that season of prayer and fasting that they hear from God. It's in that season of prayer and fasting that the Holy Spirit's call is obeyed. So they're praying and fasting. They hear the call to set apart Saul and Barnabas, and then they pray and fast again before they send them out. So it's the bookends of this great missionary endeavor. Let's talk for a moment about fasting, because there's a lot of questions people have about fasting and some misconceptions I'd like to get rid of if we can. First of all, let's look at what fasting isn't. Fasting is not a hunger strike in which you try to get God to do what you want him to do. And I know that sounds terrible. Like we, I would never do that, but we kind of can do that really easily. I, I really want God to do something, so I'm going to fast. I'm going to starve myself a, in order to get God to do what I want him to do. That's the wrong mentality. If that's, if that's the mentality that sparks a fast, that's a fleshly fast. That's not going to accomplish anything. Okay, that's not what fasting is. What fasting is, is it's all about humbling our souls. You find that in Leviticus 16.9 when it says they shall humble them so, their, their souls. Some translations will say it that way. That's, that's what we're doing. It's humbling ourselves before God. You find that in Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58 is the key. If there's one chapter of the Bible, I'd say read this before you undertake a fast. It would be Isaiah chapter 58. It's a way for us to humble our souls, and as we do that, we posture our hearts to hear from God and to be heard by God. There's two things going on with the fast. I want to be able to hear from God, and I want Him to be able to hear me. I would encourage you, read Daniel chapter 10 to understand the spiritual warfare that's going on that fasting can be a part of. You can be part of waging, a, waging conflict that's going on around you that you have no idea about in the natural. I would encourage you to read Daniel chapter 10 and read Isaiah 58. Get a good understanding about fasting. Fasting is a way to block out all what I call fleshly noise from our life. Now, just recently, our family took a trip and we flew from Kalispell into Seattle, ran a car, drove to Ocean Shores and spent a few days uh, just on the coast. And... I don't know about you, but, you know, we, we live in Glacier County and the traffic's pretty light here. <laughs> I mean, even when you go, to, you pick up the interstate over by Shelby or um, by Valier, if you, if you pick up the interstate, the interstate in Montana is pretty, you know, it, it, it's pretty laid back compared to where, what it is in major cities. So we land in Seattle, we get our rental car, and immediately, as soon as you are pulling out of the rental car facility there, you are immediately thrust into a high-pressure driving situation. You got a lot of lanes, you got a lot of signs, there's, you're under sensory overload. Stuff's moving all around you, you're trying to pick up the right signs to get to the right place, you're trying to listen to Siri who's directing you what lane to be in, to turn, to get to where you want to go. There's all kinds of information being thrown at you. Before we had Siri to tell us what lane we needed to be in, you just had to pay attention to signs. Now, I don't know if any of you ever did this, or maybe you still do, but sometimes we'd have our radio on in the car, or we'd have a, a CD on, or an MP3 player. We got music going in the car. 
or we got the news on or something, something there's sound and in, in we're listening to something on our car radio while we're driving, but we're, we're getting to a place where I need to find a certain exit and I'm looking for that exit sign. Where is it? And so what do I do? I turn down my stereo. Oh, what is the connection between the, what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing? You ever, have you ever thought about that? Why, when I'm looking for a street, I'm looking for a particular house and a house number, I got to turn down the radio so I can see better? That doesn't make sense. Except what I'm actually doing is I'm tuning out the noise so I can focus. That's what fasting does for us. It's a way to tune out the noise from our life. It's a way to acquire God's perspective. That's what's going on. Now, from verse 4, the scenery is going to change. They're going to travel to the island of Cyprus. And uh, throughout this first missionary journey, they're going to travel to a number of places. I'll show you a map here in just a moment. But throughout this, I want you to be sensitive to how the Word of God is going to follow a pattern. They're going to, they're going to proclaim what God is saying. They're going to proclaim the message about Jesus. That message is then going to be opposed. And then the message is going to be ultimately proven powerful. So it's going to be proclaimed, opposed, and then proven powerful. We'll see a sample of that on the island of Cyprus. In verse 4, it says, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they reached Salamis, which is a coastal city in western Cyprus, when they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John, who I put in brackets. His name is also Mark. This is the John Mark who they brought up from Jerusalem to Antioch in Acts chapter 12. He's also, uh, it was his family's house that the prayer meeting was going on at uh, when Peter was in prison in Acts chapter 12. So they bring John Mark with them. He's going to be the one that writes the, uh, the, the gospel of Mark. Uh, he's going to be more connected with Peter's ministry than with, with Paul's, but on this occasion, he's with them on this first leg of the first missionary journey. And he's just along as their heper, helper. <laughs> helper. He's <clears throat> along with them as their helper. So this first missionary journey, they start in Antioch, as you see here on the map I put on your screen there in Syria. They're going to travel to Salamis, and uh, they're going to travel through the island of Cyprus, visiting different synagogues. They'll end up at the, uh, the provincial capital at Paphos. From there, they're going to sail over to uh, what is today the southern coast of Turkey, to Pamphylia, to Perga. They will then go north to the Pisidian Antioch, where they'd spend some considerable time in ministry. They will travel through southern Galatia to Iconium, Lystra, Derby, And then instead of making a complete circuit and then traveling back to Antioch, they backtrack uh, to all those places that they visited in, uh, in man, mainland uh, Asia, as it was known then, Turkey as it's known today, before returning to Syria. It says, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues. So I got a picture. This is a picture here of the synagogue at uh, Capernaum in Israel today. And so it gives you an idea of what they looked like inside. They were small. They were a lot like little churches in that time period. It is appropriate, I've said this before, I'll say it again, it's appropriate that God's message be proclaimed to the Israeli people first. The Gospels to the Jew first, and then to the Greek or the Gentile, Romans 1.16. But beyond this, there's something very practical about it. There's very practical reasons about bringing God's messianic message about Jesus to the synagogues first. So let's look at a couple of the reasons why they would do that. Synagogues form the nucleus of the spiritual life of the Israeli people. This is true today, to this day. It was also true in the first century, especially when people lived outside the land and the temple was not accessible to them. A synagogue was a way for you to stay connected with your people, with your culture, with the God that you serve. And so when you go into synagogue, you would hear the word of God proclaimed. You would, they, would, they would read the scriptures there. There would be prayer there. You would connect with other Israelis. And so it was a way for you to stay connected with your, your hometown culture, as it were, but it was your home away from home, spiritually speaking. And it's a useful place to gather. So they were little community centers. They were a lot like how churches function to this day. Synagogues also provide a useful context and infrastructure for proclaiming God's message that the Messiah has come. Verse 6, when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar-Jesus. 
Now, one of the characters that's present here in this missionary trip is a guy by the name of Barnabas. His name means son of encouragement. Bar, in Aramaic, it means son of. Okay, so Bar Jesus. Jesus is a very common Hebrew name in that time period. Bar Jesus just means son of Jesus. He is apparently of Jewish, uh, eth- ethnically, I should say, he is, he's Israeli, he's Jewish. But he is a magician, and right off the bat, he's called a false prophet. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. So let's talk about this character here, this false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was apparently a spiritual advisor or a consultant of sorts to the Roman proconsul. We'll talk about him in just a moment. But right off the bat, we're told that he's a false prophet. And as we read on, we will begin to understand why he is regarded as a false prophet. So this Jewish false prophet is opposing them there. He's, he's present there, and he's going to be cast in the role of the um, antagonist here. Okay, Be sensitive to the spiritual conflict that's taking place. Okay, There's a spiritual conflict going on. You have a Jewish false prophet, and you have men who have been sent out on this trip as a result of a prophetic utterance. So the true prophetic and the false prophetic are coming to blows here in a sense. It was through authentic prophetic ministry that Saul and Barnabas, they get sent out on this missionary journey. And while they're on that missionary journey, this confrontation takes place between the true prophetic and the false prophetic. And I think it's worth slowing down a little bit this morning and looking at this. It says this guy was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. It says a man of intelligence because... Throughout the book of, of Acts and Romans, uh, excuse me, Acts and Luke, Luke presents the Roman characters. He, he never presents them really in a negative light. Now, the kings that they that they appointed over the Jewish people are many times cast in a negative light. Men like Herod Agrippa, Herod the Great, etc., uh, get get portrayed in a, a negative light in the Gospels. But but Luke doesn't uh, ever portray centurions in a negative light. He portrays the Romans as being pretty fair and generous guys. And it's believed that Luke's intent in that is to demonstrate that the church, that Christianity is not a threat to the Roman Empire. And it's believed by some that Luke's writings presented uh, or that constituted, at least in part, uh, the trial documents for Paul when he appealed to the Roman emperor. We'll talk about that more as we get later into the, into the book here. But he is a man of intelligence. He says he's a proconsul. Sergius Paulus is a proconsul. Now, a proconsul is a Roman governor that was appointed by the Senate as opposed to a governor that's appointed by the emperor. The emperor could appoint someone as a governor, appoint someone as a king over a province. Uh, but the Senate, if, they, if the Senate ruled a particular province, sometimes the Roman Empire... Uh, It it got to be so big that sometimes the Roman emperor would take a province and say to the Senate, you guys manage this particular. It's not super sensitive. I've got enough things to deal with that are sensitive. You guys handle that. It's a low crime area. And so the Senate would manage that area and they would appoint a proconsul or a governor to that province. Now, I highlight that here for this reason. Luke's use of the correct terminology, his terminology here is 100% correct for the time period in which these events were taking place. There are people who try to say that Luke was written hundreds of years later, and if that were the case, the Roman Empire changes uh, quite a bit in, in 100 years. 200 years, it's, it's shifted even more. So the terminology that's used here is appropriate to the time period in which this took place. You would not expect a later author to be that careful. It's written as though it's written by an eyewitness who is living contemporary to these times. And so this is another uh, strong evidence, I believe, of a, uh, th- that Luke was written contemporary. It was written certainly before A.D. 66. So fairly early within uh, three, gener- three decades of uh, Jesus ascension. Luke tells us this man summons Barnabas and Saul for the purpose of hearing the word of God. So let's look at what happens for this. Verse 8, but Elymas, the magician, for so his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So Elymas is another, is another name for this guy. 
He's called a magician, sorcerer of sorts. He dabbles in the occult, but he's presented himself as a prophet, someone who hears from God. And on this occasion, he is opposing Barnabas and Saul, who the governor has asked to come and, you know, present their message to him. It's unclear what the connection is between the names Bar-Jesus and Elymas. There's lots of conjectures about it. We're not going to get into that. It's, it's really just not clear what the connection is. What is clear to us is that what this man was attempting to do. What this man was attempting to do was to turn the proconsul away from believing in and following Jesus. That's what he's trying to do. So this false prophet is actively seeking to talk the proconsul out of believing in Jesus. And so in that sense, he's almost like an anti-evangelist, the opposite of what you would expect an evangelist to do. And certainly the opposite you'd accept, you would expect a true prophet to do. And so we've seen the word of God proclaimed, now we see it opposed. Let's see what happens next. It says in verse 9, But Saul, who was known as Paul... Hmm, this is the first time we run into this. Saul, who is also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze upon him and does the most unlikely thing. You know, you're in a high-pressure situation, high-ranking official. You expect him to comport himself with some dignity, right? And be very choose his words very carefully. And I believe he does. But he takes a course of action that's far more aggressive than you would expect someone to take, given the circumstances. He says, you who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. It gets better. He's, he levels a curse on this guy. He says, the hand of the Lord is upon you and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. So this is the first time we find out that Saul has another name. He's also known as Paul. Saul of Tarsus has a Roman name. That's interesting. So this Hebrew of Hebrews has a Roman name. And what's interesting is he actually has a Roman name that he shares the same Roman name as this Roman proconsul. Sergius Paulus. If you look it up in the Greek, you find out that Paul would have probably heard his name pronounced Paulus, just like this Roman governor. So interesting that Luke chooses this occasion in which to reveal this. Uh, and so later on, we discover that, that this Hebrew of Hebrews, this Pharisee, this member, uh, possibly member of the Sanhedrin, there's some people that try to make that case, this guy who is educated by Gamaliel actually has Roman citizenship, which is probably not something that he, you know, flashed around when he was traveling in Judea or living in Jerusalem. That would probably have um, cast him in a very negative light. But he's going to pull that card out and use it on some strategic occasions, as we'll see later on in the book of Acts. From this point onwards, we only ever see him referred to by his Roman name of Paul. And uh, so why the change? Why, why all of a sudden does Luke decide to start calling this guy by his Roman name instead of by his Hebrew name? There's lots of conjectures for that. Uh, there's lots of people, you know, you can look at what the names mean and try to extrapolate some kind of understanding, some deeper message there. I tend to think that the simplest explanation makes the most sense, and that is that it tends to emphasize, you know, by referring to him as Paul, it tends to emphasize his unique ministry to the non-Israeli Gentile people. And uh, so the book, book of Acts is going to begin to focus more and more. It's going to increasingly focus on ministry to non-Israeli nations, non-Israeli people as we get further along. And so referring to him by this Roman name tends to emphasize that he has a unique calling to these people. It says, Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. I would underline that or mark that in a distinct way. So what he says doesn't come out of his flesh. This is the Holy Spirit, and he's flowing right through Paul in this moment. It's probably one of those cases where Paul opens his mouth, and he says it, and he knows it. If you've ever been in this situation, you know it's God saying it through you, but it surprises even you what just came out of your mouth. That's what's happening here. He confronts him in a way that's similar to how Peter confronted Simon the sorcerer back in Acts chapter 8 in Samaria. So, Holy Spirit is flowing directly through Paul, 
And under this surge of Holy Spirit empowerment, I liken it to the spiritual equivalent of a surge of adrenaline. Okay, it's the spiritual equivalent to that, perhaps. Paul speaks out boldly and he exposes four things about this man that this man that were true of this man that he probably did not know about himself. So I want to wrap things up this morning by looking at these four things here. And let's not look at this as just an indictment of this guy. Let's just see, God, what are you saying to us this morning in all of this? Four things. First thing he shows is his character. What is his true character? He's tried to present himself as being a prophet, uh, someone who's in the know with, with spiritual powers and a man of God. He's tried to present himself in this way to uh, his boss, this governor. But Paul says, you're full of all deceit and fraud. It's very interesting. Simon, the sorcerer, presented, tried to present himself, pass himself off as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, been baptized, I believe in Jesus, and yet the Holy Spirit exposes, he says, your heart is not right with God. Are you willing to let the Holy Spirit expose your character? Can, can he tell you what your character really is? Because he wants to deal with that. He wants to take your character and shift it and shape it to be like Jesus. This Elymas character is not who he has portrayed himself to be. He is not full of truth like a prophet should. He is full of deceit and fraud. He's a lot like Pharaoh's court magicians. And in in a way that's very similar to what happens with those court magicians in the book of Exodus, uh, this man is about to be exposed as a fake. He addresses the spiritual lineage of this character, Elymas. He addresses his character, and then he says, you son of the devil. That's pretty aggressive language, I guess. Uh, But surprisingly enough, Jesus uses this language in confrontations in the Gospels. You find it in Matthew 13. You find it in John chapter 8, very notably in John 8, 44. He says, you son of the devil. You know, he had been trading upon his being a blood relative of truly godly people. I'm a descendant of Abraham, the friend of God. And there's people today, they will try to trade upon their connection. I'm a relative of this very godly person. And because I'm their relative, gee, I must be regarded by you as a really godly person. There's people that try to trade upon their connection, their family connection, as though that somehow imparts some special godliness upon them. John the baptizer, Jesus, here Paul himself, all attack this very vigorously. He's showing what his true spiritual lineage is. Your behavior reveals your genuine spiritual lineage. If your behavior looks like the devil, then your lineage is you're not a son of God. You're not a child of God. You are a child of the devil, an offspring of serpents. Okay? So he's, he's using the same kind of terminology we've seen John the baptizer and Jesus use. And he's attacking this idea that just because you're a relative of a godly person, that does not impart godliness or righteousness to you. And we would be well advised to take that seriously. You can be the child of the most godly person in the world and go and spend eternity in hell because you live like the devil. Jesus addresses it in John 8, 44. He says, you're doing the deeds of your father, the devil. You're you're trying to kill me. That's what the devil tried to do from the very beginning was prevent Jesus from coming. Tried to kill him on a number of occasions before he was born. Tried to kill him when he was born. Tried to kill him after he was born. Finally, when he did kill him, he messed up because that was the plan of God on on that particular occasion. He says, you're trying to kill me. You're revealing through your actions that you are an offspring of Satan. You're not connected to God. You're connected to the devil. And Jesus said, I came to sever that connection, but you've got to trust in me. you got to pledge your life to me. you got to trust in me. Don't trust in grandpa. Don't trust in your great grandpa. Don't trust in your mom. You've got to trust in me, Jesus, alone. That's the message there. So he addresses his character. His spiritual lineage gets revealed. Then his spiritual status. What's his true spiritual status? Because he's tried to present himself as being a godly person, but he's called here an enemy of all righteousness. He says, you're an enemy of everything that is right. You're an enemy of everything that is right. This guy is actively trying to talk the proconsul out of believing in and following Jesus. Let me say this. Anyone 
who tries to talk someone out of believing in and or living for Jesus is an enemy of all righteousness. You know, husbands, dads, people in your family that try to get their wives or their kids or their sons, try to get them to not follow Jesus you are an enemy of all righteousness. Do you realize that? You're trying to keep your wife from going to church. You're trying to keep your kids from, from being involved in church. You're trying to, trying to keep them from following Jesus. because And the reason you do that, because it intimidates you that they might be more spiritual than you. Rather than deal with your own sin, rather than humble yourself before God, you would prefer rather to keep them down because they make you feel uncomfortable. They're right, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus that's been imparted to them, it convicts you of your sin, so you try to make them live more ungodly so that you can be more comfortable. And God says to you this morning, sir, you are an enemy of all, unrighteous, of all righteousness. You are an enemy of everything that God calls right, and you need to deal with that. You need to fall on your knees and repent of that. God is talking to someone this morning. You need to repent of that. That is important that you get right with God. That is not a cool thing to be doing. And so Paul, he, ad he addresses that here. Holy Spirit, through Paul, is calling some heavy things out. He addresses the spiritual ministry of this guy. He's presented himself as someone who's godly, who's in the know uh, with God and, and, and communicates with spirits. And so he's, he's tried to trade off on this and present himself in this way. But Paul, uh, Holy Spirit through Paul reveals what's really going on. He says, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Think about that for a second. It's an inversion of Isaiah 40 verse 3. He's casting this guy as the opposite of John the baptizer. See, John the baptizer came proclaiming, make straight the way of the Lord. See, that's what pr true prophetic ministry does, is it makes straight the way of the Lord. This guy's making the way of the Lord crooked and hard to find. That's why he calls him an enemy of everything that God calls right, an enemy of righteousness. Prophetically, this makes him the opposite of the Messiah's forerunner from Isaiah 40, verse 3, who, you know, John the baptizer, he's a prophet's prophet. You understand prophetic ministry, you need to understand what it says in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. I'm going to summarize it this way. What Holy Spirit is communicating to this fellow here is he's communicating this. He's saying you are doing the opposite of what true prophetic ministry is meant to do. True prophetic ministry is meant to draw people to believe in and live for Jesus. I'll say that again. Prophetic ministry is meant to draw people to believe in and live for Jesus. That's what the true prophetic means to do. The false prophetic will be a perversion of that. False prophetic, you know, if, if the prophetic ministry causes you to want to follow the prophet, that is false prophet, prophetic ministry. True prophetic ministry makes you run after Jesus. It makes you want to believe in and follow after Jesus more than anything else. False prophetic ministry is like a narcotic that makes you addicted to that prophet, addicted to that prophetic word, and makes you want to run after and get more words. Understand the difference. Understand what Isaiah 40 verse 3 says. It'll tell you what you need to know about true prophetic ministry. Also, check out uh, Revelation chapter 19. There's a verse in there that says that the, uh, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So true prophetic ministry is meant to draw people to believe in and live for Jesus. Anything else is a perversion of that. He says, the hand of the Lord is upon you and you will be blind for a time. Wow, he levels a judgment on this guy. But again, this is the Holy Spirit speaking through him. And this is, this is pretty bold. The Holy Spirit, through Paul, pronounces a judgment on this false prophet. And it's interesting because in biblical times, a prof prophet was sometimes called a seer, one who sees. And so the seer is made blind. Poetic justice, in a sense. That which befalls the false prophet it's strikingly similar to what happens to Paul, what he experienced when he was called Saul on the road to Damascus. Temporary blindness. He experiences in the natural, his inability to see with his natural eyes is an appropriate reflection of his true spiritual condition. Spiritually, you have been blind for a long time. Now, let me make you experience in the natural what your spiritual condition has been like. In John chapter 9, verses 39 to 41, Jesus says some, some very useful parallel things. He said, For judgment I came into this world so that those who do not see may see. 
Those who say, God, I'm blind, I don't get it. He says, I'm going to open their eyes. But those who think they see, he says, those who see, who think they see anyways, may become blind. In other words, if you think you got it, if you think that you know that you can you can learn your way into this and you can get all the understanding on your own, you don't really need God's help, and you you can you can see what you need to see on your own. He says you're going to actually be blind. But if you'll humble yourself before me, are you seeing a common thread here? Humility, humility, humility. If you'll humble yourself before me, God says I'll open your eyes so that you can see how things really are. That's what true prophetic ministry wants to do, is to draw people to know and follow Jesus. And he's the one that opens up our eyes to see how things really are. Those are the Pharisees, the religious elite, those who are highly educated. These are the guys that went to, for years of Bible school for their, 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 their bachelors and their masters and their doctorates. And they got all these degrees in theology. They were with him and they heard these things. They said to him, we're not blind too, are we? We got all this education. Look at our stacks of diplomas and, and all our credentials and everything. And he says this to them. If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. The importance is, again, if you're willing to humble yourself before me and say, God, I've learned all this stuff, but I feel like I don't really know. I feel blind. I really don't see, and I need you to open my eyes. He says, I'll open your eyes. I'll open your spirit eyes so you can really see. But if you think that you can do this on your own apart from me, you're going to find yourself more blind than you've ever been. And so this Elymas is struck with blindness in the natural, which is a reflection of his spiritual blindness, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand, which is ironic because the governor had sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But this Elymas is opposing this. So the proconsul is seeking someone, in a sense, to guide him by the hand spiritually. And Elymas, the proconsul's spiritual advisor, is trying to disrupt that guidance. But now he's struck with natural blindness and so now he's the one seeking those who would lead him by the hand. Verse 12, Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. So the proconsul believes in Jesus. The word of God that was proclaimed and opposed is now powerfully proven. False prophets attempt to dissuade him, to talk him out of believing in Jesus has utterly failed. We're not told what became of Elymas. We're not told of what became of this false prophet. You know, we wonder, did, did he ever, you know, come to know Jesus like Saul did? I mean, did he repent and, and turn around like Saul did on, on the road to Damascus? You know, he was struck blind, blind for three days, but he gives his life completely over to Jesus. He's, he's a totally different person. Did that ever happen for this false prophet? We don't know. We're simply not told. What we are told is that the governor, the proconsul, of the third largest island in the Mediterranean became a believer in Jesus. And if we were to step back for just a moment and look at where this story started and where it's taken us, it's interesting what started in a prayer meeting, what started in a worship meeting, what started in just maybe a night of just praise and worship, just ministering to the Lord, has led to a result some weeks, days, weeks, months, we don't know the duration of time, Later, where a very influential person on the island of Cyprus comes to know Jesus. People are hearing about him for the very first time. And men who are in that meeting are doing things that they never dreamed that they would do. And God's using them in more powerful ways than they ever dreamed was possible. But it all started with a willingness to just get into God's presence and say, God, I'm here for you. I I just want to praise you. I just want to worship you. I want to humble myself before you. I just want to get your perspective on life. I I have all this education. People call me a teacher, but I don't really know, and I need to know you. It's in knowing you that that I know what I need to know and can pass along what you reveal to me, but I need to know you. It's in that season of worship and humbling themselves before God that God does some incredible things in and through them, and I believe he wants to do that in our life today. I believe that he wants to do that for us. How seriously are we taking him? How much time do we have left to show the world around us who Jesus is? 
there's for a lot of people, they're not going to come into a church door. They're only going to know Jesus perhaps through our personal witness, our personal testimony. How prepared are we to be that witness of Jesus to the world around us? That's why it's important for us to gather together, get into God's presence, spend those seasons, those those times in prayer and fasting because it's in the, those kinds of environments that God can do can, can open our eyes, our spiritual eyes to what he's wanted to do in and through us for a long time. He can, he can get us moving in the right direction. I believe that God's wanting to shift people. This is a year of sifting and shifting. And I believe God wants to shift some people and, it, and wants to shift them in a powerful and positive direction. But you're going to need to posture your heart to hear from heaven. Someone, God is talking to you right now, several of you right now. God wants you to posture your heart to hear from heaven. You need to quiet the noise in your life like they did. What, what God wants to do in you might not look anything like what we read this morning. It's unique to you. But you need to quiet your spirit, drown out the noise, shut out the noise from life, get God's perspective. If you'll do that, I believe that God is going to take you on, some, uh, on a journey. It's going to start this year. It's going to, he's going to take you on a journey, and you're going, to, you're going to be following him and doing things you never thought you'd find yourself doing. But you're going to know that he's in it because his presence is just going to be overwhelmingly evident in your life. Wow. It's so cool to follow Jesus. You just never know. You never know what, what, what God could do in a person's life. This guy who was a major villain in the book of Acts, now we find him preaching to the governor on the island of Cyprus. Look at the journey God has taken Saul of Tarsus on. It's going to get better. We're going to see more next time. We'll get into uh, Paul's first sermon in the latter half of, uh, or the bulk really from chapter 13, verse 13, on to the end, and I think it's verse 52. We'll see what God's going to do in and through their ministry. It's going to be some really neat stuff that we're going to see further on. I believe God has communicated some stuff to some people today. What are you going to do with that? I encourage you not to just let it go. I encourage you to be intentional about responding to God's Word. What, what He's placed on your heart don't miss a moment. Get on your knees. Get alone with him sometime today. Work this stuff out. God wants you to be spiritually healthy. And don't miss this moment that God's been talking to you in. Don't miss it. Take, take some time today. Get alone with him. Work these things out. Listen and watch what he wants to do in your life. Watch him fulfill the things that he showed you years ago that you're being reminded of now. There's things that God wants to do in and through you. And he wants to start it, and he's just waiting on you. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, you've been speaking to us today. Lord, I just pray that you would give us the courage to respond in the way that you want us to, to respond to what you've said, to make the changes that we need to make, the adjustments that we need to make, to take the time and the season to get alone with you if, we, if needs be, to get the direction that you uh, that you want to impart to us to, to, be, to be able to receive your instructions and be obedient to those instructions. Lord, I just thank you for your presence in and through our lives. I pray that, that you would move more powerfully in and through us, that we would, uh, we would be able to minister to you more effectively, Lord. I pray that we would be sensitive to your needs, that we would be intentional about ministering unto you, that we might be a blessing to you. You've been such a blessing to us. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen and amen. Well, God bless you and keep you. We'll see you back here again next time. We're going to have a, a great service next week. We're going to look at uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 13. Come and see us on Sunday morning. We are open for business at, on Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock. We have live praise and worship. That's a great opportunity for you to gather together and minister unto the Lord along with us. Hope we'll see you next week. God bless you.